everybody. Today is a very special feast in the church's calendar. Today is the feast of one of my favorite saints, the little flower, Saint Therese. And I want to do a little live video here on Facebook to celebrate her spousal mysticism. Therese was one of those great mystics who understood her intimate union with Jesus as a spousal union. And so she can be a bright light for us as we seek to live the theology of the body in our own lives. I teach a course every year at the St. Therese Institute for Faith of Faith and Mission in Bruno, Saskatchewan, Canada. It's one of the highlights of my year going up there to teach. And what I do is I, I over the course of three and a half days, I unfold John Paul II's Theology of the Body to the students there, but I weave in St. Therese's whole spousal mysticism and the spirituality of her little way. So I'm going to draw some ideas out here for you that I've taken from that course that I teach. There are a lot of things about St. Therese you may not know, things about her personality that you can read in her autobiography that just blows out of the water this hyper-pious notion we often have of the saints. Here's just a few things about her personality. She was very stubborn, and when she was a little girl, she threw all kinds of tantrums. In fact, her mother had to tie her down to her bed because she, she threw these tantrums. She was very fussy as a kid, and she had to touch everything. She tells the story of when she was in Rome. Let me see if I can find it. Uh, oh, yeah. She tells a story when she was in Rome. She was 14 years old. She says, I always had to find a way of touching everything. At the Holy Cross Church in Rome, we were able to venerate several pieces of the true cross, she says, two thorns and one of the sacred nails. She says, the nail was enclosed in this magnificent golden reliquary, which did not have a glass covering. And she says, I found a way of placing my little finger in one of the openings of the reliquary and I could touch the nail that had been bathed in the blood of Jesus. Really, I was far too brazen, she says. In fact, another aspect that reveals, or another thing that reveals an aspect of her personality. When she met Pope Leo XIII, she was 14 years old. She was in Rome and she was begging him to let her enter the convent when she was 15. And she was told when she went into this audience with the Pope, she was with several other people, she was told, you are forbidden to speak. <laughs> Did this stop her? No, she spoke anyway. She says, Holy Father, in honor of your Jubilee, permit me to enter Carmel at the age of 15. When he told her to do what her, the superiors told her, she pressed the Pope, Oh, Holy Father, if you say yes, everyone will agree. Two guards literally had to carry her away in this audience with the Pope. Pretty funny aspects of her personality. She was very witty. She loved to tell jokes. She loved to laugh. She loved to make others laugh. And on her deathbed at the age of 24, in the midst of some great, great suffering, she was still full of jokes. And on her deathbed, she had all kinds of desires, including she asked her sisters, please get me a chocolate eclair before she died. She was apparently very fond of chocolate eclairs. She loved nature. I especially love this about Therese. She writes about her love of the countryside, of birds, of grass, trees, wide open spaces, snow, the sea, the sun, the moon, stars, waterfalls, mountains, lakes, breezes, and of course, Flowers. We know her name, of course, as the Little Flower. We'll talk about flowers in a bit. She liked noisy kisses. I love that about her. There, she was also quite bugged when she was in the convent by a nun who sat in front of her during prayer in the chapel who, who made all these clicking noises with her mouth. Who knows what? I don't know. But she talks about how bugged she was by these clicking noises of the nun and how they almost drove her mad. But she took them as an opportunity to grow in patience and humility. Uh, she experienced a, a little bit of ecstasy when she was a little girl, when she was given a, a knife or a pocket knife, I guess. She was a girl and she said this filled her with joy to the point of 
ecstasy. I love, love, love her heart here. And she also experienced some very fierce temptations against God. And apparently, at least this is uh, Cardinal Ratzinger's take on the situation. He writes about this in his book, Introduction to Christianity. He says, many of her fellow nuns toned down her temptations in less than accurate translations of her writings. They found this perhaps unbecoming of a nun to have such violent temptations against faith and against God. But we know, of course, this is part of the experience of many of the mystics, where they are tempted against faith. Uh, we have a lot of people joining us here, people saying hello. Uh, Yvonne, hey Yvonne, you're welcome for these stories. Uh, LJ, hello LJ. Other people, people chiming in and saying hello, thanks for joining me in this live broadcast. Let me share some other things about Therese. Why the little flower? What's that name all about? You know, we, we call her the little flower. She's referred to as the little flower. But do we know where that name comes from? She loved flowers. She loved flowers. And in order to get to the root of that love of flowers, we, we have to get to the root of what a flower is. Therese was very big on reading the book of nature. Uh, I already shared her love of nature. She always was able to find the truth of God revealed through his creation. Why did she name herself a little flower? Well, let me read directly from her. She says, I recall a symbolic action my father performed, not realizing its full meaning. Going up to a low wall, he pointed out some little white flowers, like lilies in miniature, and plucking one of them, he gave it to me explaining the care with which God brought it into being and preserved it to that very day. While I listened, I believe I was hearing my own story. So great was the resemblance between what Jesus had done for this little flower and what he had done for little Therese. She speaks about flowers with a great awe. And if we, we think about what a flower is, what what is a flower? It's it's one of nature's most beautiful reproductive organs. That's the very function of the flower. Flowers are part and parcel of the symbolism of the Christian life. In fact, do you know where we get the word chalice for the mass? Where do we get the word chalice? It comes from the calyx of a flower. The calyx of a flower is the cup that holds the dew. And Therese uses this imagery. She says, speaking of the dew of humiliation, she writes that this little flower herself, she's the flower, preserves in the bottom of her calyx the precious drops of dew she received from Jesus. And these serve to remind her always of how little and weak she is. Little and weak, but in that weakness of a little flower, receiving this dew from heaven, she becomes infinitely fertile. And this is the whole mystery of the flower. It's the, it's the fertility organ, it's the reproductive organ of the plant, the flower. To speak of herself as a little flower is to speak about really being Eucharistic, receiving this dew. What does the priest pray over the chalice, right? Where we get the, the word chalice again from the calyx of a flower. Let the Holy Spirit come upon these gifts like the dewfall. Astounding, astounding mysteries. Therese had an intuitive sense of these mysteries. And she lived as a little flower. Why a little flower? Because her whole understanding of the spiritual life is one of remaining little. We speak of her little way. She says, I am astonished at nothing. I'm not disturbed at seeing myself to be weakness itself. On the contrary, it is in my weakness that I glory, and I expect each day to discover new imperfections in myself. Therese gives us beautiful, beautiful insight into the paradox of true holiness. Here's the paradox of true holiness. We become more holy the more unholy we realize we are. That's the paradox. Or we could say this, the more imperfect we realize we are, the more perfect we become. It's the same paradox of saying, when I'm weak, then I'm strong. Here's another quote from Therese. She says, I learn that the more one advances on the journey with the Lord, 
the more one sees the goal is still far off. And now I am simply resigned to see myself always imperfect. And in this, I find my joy. Let me just push the pause button on that. I don't know about you, but <laughs> I struggle to find my joy in my imperfections because I have a really skewed idea of, of, of the spiritual life. Uh, you know, if you, like me, kind of roll your eyes when you hear saints like Therese talking about how imperfect they are, it, it only serves to demonstrate what a false notion of holiness we have. True holiness, all the saints talk about this, true holiness, growing in perfection, means growing in a recognition of our imperfection. It means staying little. It means recognizing our weakness. It means allowing God's strength to work through our weakness. It means allowing God's perfection to work through our imperfections. Some people are joining us. Hey, Mike. Uh, hi, Dorothy. Hi, Stephanie. Hi, Francisca. God bless you guys. Uh, everybody's saying thank you. You are welcome. You are welcome. I'm really enjoying doing these live videos. Let me tell you a little bit about Therese's spousal mysticism. And this can shine a bright light for us on living the theology of the body. So, of course, Therese is a Carmelite. She's formed uh, in the Carmelite spirituality in the teaching of St. John of the Cross and St. Teresa of Avila. And it reveals this, this spirituality of the Carmelites reveals this rich, rich spousal understanding of the Christian life. Therese yearned to be the bride of Christ from a very young age, and not merely in a poetic sense, but as a woman with a very real and ardent yearning for the love of the bridegroom. This was not just a, a, a metaphor for Therese. She considered herself Jesus' bride. She considered herself to be married to Jesus. Jesus was her bridegroom, and she felt this from a very early age. She's, she's writing here of her experience of going through puberty when desire is awakening, and listen to what she says. I was at the most dangerous age for young girls when desire is getting awakened and we can be carried away in, in disordered directions. She says, I was at this most dangerous age for young girls, but God did for me what Ezekiel reports in his prophecies. Behold, your time was the time of lovers, and I spread my garment over you, says the prophet Ezekiel, and I entered into a covenant with you, and you became mine. Therese says that when her, her longing as, as a young woman, as her longing for love was being awakened, she learned at a very early age to direct that longing for love and union to her heavenly bridegroom to her true spouse and this is what saved her this is what saved her from any temptation or from from uh, you know so often we we can take those desires in disordered directions Therese's spousal mysticism saved her from that and we are the beneficiaries of her deep intimate spousal love of Jesus let me share with you a little bit about what she says about how ardent her own desires were for the bridegroom. Let me see if I... Oh, here it is. Here it is. So Therese, at her own admission, Therese was a woman of fierce, passionate desire. She says, my desires caused me a veritable martyrdom, she says. The pain of experiencing what we could call the infinitization of desire. Wow, pause there for a moment. So often we have this idea that following Christ means we squash our desires. No, 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 no. The saints, especially the great mystics like Therese, teach us that the real journey of the Christian life is not a squashing of desire. It's a stretching of desire to the point of infinity. And so we can rightly speak of the 
infinitization of desire, where our desires for life, for love, for joy, for happiness get stretched so far that we have the capacity to receive the infinite one. She says her longing was stretched to the point of measurelessness, and this caused in her the greatest martyrdom. St. Augustine has this expression that the, the, the life of the Christian is one of being trained by longing. He says our, our lives are a gymnasium of desire. And when the Christian says the word God, for the Christian, the word God means you are the fulfillment of everything I desire. Therese lived this. She lived this powerfully and beautifully. She says that ardent thirst itself becomes the most delightful drink. Interesting, isn't it? So she's talking about allowing our hearts to be stretched to this point of measureless desire. And we have to recognize that in this life, that's really what we have is, is the stretching of desire. The Lord in his goodness, he will grant us little tastes of heavenly fulfillment in this life, the life of prayer, the life of the sacraments. We get little heavenly tastes of the fulfillment of desire. But that fulfillment of desire only comes in the next life. But we needn't be afraid of that ardent thirst because, as Therese says, ardent thirst itself becomes the most delightful drink. In other words, we come to relish in, in the, the very idea of our desires being stretched. Here's some, some other things Therese says about desire. She says, I know that Jesus would not inspire the longings I feel unless he wanted to grant them. That is good news. She had these ardent, powerful, infinitized yearnings for infinite love, for infinite joy. And thanks be to God, this is the good news of the gospel. This is what Jesus wants to grant us. Infinite love, infinite joy. For every hungry heart, there is an infinite feast that corresponds to the hunger. She says in her exuberance, Ah, my Jesus, pardon me if I am unreasonable in wishing to express my desires and longings which reach even unto infinity. Pardon me and heal my soul by giving her what she longs for so much. To be your spouse, she says, this is what I long for. To be a Carmelite and by my union with you. See, we, we see here her beautiful spousal mysticism. She understands in the spousal union with Jesus that she becomes a mother of souls. Should not this suffice for me? Should not this be enough, she says? And yet it's not so. I desire more, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, if I wanted to write all my desires, I would have to borrow your book of life. Oh, my Jesus, you desire today to grant other desires that are greater than the universe. This woman was a fireball of desire. She says, I am certain then that you will grant my desires. I know, oh my God, that the more you want to give me, the more you make me desire. This is good news. The more Jesus wants to give us, the more he makes us desire. I feel in my heart, Therese says, immense desires, and it is with confidence that I ask you to come and take possession of my soul. I want to end this little reflection here on this word confidence. This is one of the great, great gifts of St. Therese. Confidence in the Lord's promise. Confidence in the Lord's mercy. Confidence in the Lord's tenderness. Her whole little way can be summarized with that word confidence in God's love for her in her weakness, in her littleness, in her sinful, broken humanity. That's the little way, a total abandoned trust that God's mercy and love is far, far greater than any of our weaknesses or sins. I want to close with a quote from Pope uh, Pius XII. He says this, We must take St. Therese at her word 
when she invites the most unregenerate as well as the most perfect. So pause there for a moment. The most unregenerate. Pick any person in the world who you think is just degenerate, right? I'm not going to name names, but just pick someone who you think, oh my gosh, they are, they are just indulging in a tragically broken, sinful life. Take that person and then take the most perfect. Who? You want to take Therese? You want to take Mother Teresa? You want to take John Paul II? Whoever you could think there. Take any great saint. And she says, Therese says, either way, we must count nothing of value before God. Whether you're the worst of sinners or the greatest of saints, count nothing of value before God except the radical weakness and spiritual poverty of a sinful creature. Oh, oh man. You see, I'm a recovering perfectionist. And as my spiritual director once put it to me, he's a very plain spoken priest and I love him for it. So I'm going to say it like he said it. He says, Christopher, you think a saint is somebody who has all his shit together. Uh Uh-uh, uh-uh. A saint is not somebody who has his S-H-I-T together. A saint is someone who has all of his or her S-H-I-T open to the merciful love of the Father. That is the life of holiness. Not to put on a mask to pretend we got it all together, but to open up all the junk in our hearts to the merciful love of God and to have total confidence that his mercy goes far more deeply than the S-H-I-T in our hearts. That's the journey of holiness. This is what the marvelous little flower, St. Therese, teaches us about the way of holiness and about the way of that love and life and joy of the spousal mystic. Thank you for joining me in this live video. I just want to give a shout out to, to Nina. Hello from Singapore. Hi, Nina. Uh, to Colleen Savage Delwo from Minnesota, to Liz Mahoney from Halifax, Nova Scotia. Uh, Coming your way soon, Liz. Uh, Go to my website, coreproject.com, C-O-R-project.com, and click on the calendar to see when I'm coming there. Uh, Rachel. Hey, Rachel, LOL. Love this so much. Michelle Piccolo. uh, Bless you, Michelle. She says, some theologians said, It's like putting it all on the altar, giving it all to him. Absolutely. Hello, Candace. Blessings. Bernard. Hello, Bernard. Or or is it Bernard? One way or the other. I don't know. Uh, Chai B from Australia. I'm coming down under in just a couple weeks, Chai. You can go to my website to learn more about where I'll be in Australia in a few weeks. Uh, Terry uh, from Texas. Liz. Uh, you're all signed up, you say. Peter Adams, God bless you, good sir, from Bristol. Uh, Peter Whaley, woo, thanks. Francisca, thank you. You're so welcome, guys. I love doing these live videos. I'm new at it, but I'm going to keep experimenting and just see what you guys like. Uh, Maria, hi, Maria, from New Zealand. Uh, Chris, New Zealand, one day, brother, we'll make it happen one day. Look forward to it. Uh, Christine, many blessings. Thank you for your message. You're welcome. Another Anne-Marie from Sydney, Australia. Bless you guys. So fun to be talking to you from around the world. If you guys like these videos, um, you know what you can do. I have a whole library of videos that you can have access to. Over 250 short videos that will help you to learn, live, and share the theology of the body. And you can have access to these videos as well as access to my library of online talks and a lot of other benefits by becoming a member of the core project. The $10 a month to be a member goes to support this global mission. Uh, Everybody paying 10 bucks a month to be part of the core project is like another brick going into a foundation. We have a multi-million dollar vision to bring this theology of the body to the world in a big way and, and we need your help. But I'm not asking for a handout. I'm not asking for a donation. Members of the core project paying $10 a month, you're getting a service Uh, We're providing you with ongoing formation in the theology of the body. You get lots of benefits. So go to core membership, C-O-R-membership.com to learn more about becoming a member of the core project. 
You guys are awesome. I love serving you. Uh, I love sharing these gems with you about the lives of the saints and living the theology of the body. Thanks for being part of this mission with me. Until next time, share the video. Get it out to friends and family. Uh, we need to really, really soak in the treasures that the Catholic Church gives us, and we need to share them with others. Till next time, peace and blessings. Take care, guys.